Welcome to Cultural Mixtapes. I'm Tejas Srinivasan. This is a show where I try to probe the minds of writers, musicians, artists, and pretty much anyone else making intriguing contributions to the cultural zeitgeist. On today's inaugural episode, we have poet, novelist, biographer, and professor at Middlebury College, Jay Perini. Throughout his illustrious career, Perini has authored several biographies on writers including Robert Frost, John Steinbeck, and Gore Vidal. His novel about Leo Tolstoy, The Last Station, was adapted into an award-winning motion picture in 2009 starring Christopher Plummer and Helen Mirren. His most recent book, Borges and Me, is about an excursion with Argentinian short story writer Jorge Luis Borges in Scotland. We spoke over Zoom in late June and touched on everything from faith to politics to war. Jay Perini's insights are grounded in close readings and meditations on poetry, philosophy, and religious texts, and they provide a refreshing way of thinking about the polarized world we live in. Our conversation weaved between the artistic and political and was filled with little nuggets of writing tips that stemmed from his 50-year teaching career. Before we begin, a fair warning, I am one of his students and took a class with Professor Perini this past spring. Do with that what you will. Hope you enjoy the show. Professor Jay Perini, thank you so much for being here today. Glad to be here with you, Tejas. Your latest novel slash memoir, Borges and Me, was published in 2020 by Doubleday. And before diving into the nitty gritties of the memoir, can you give a brief intro as to how exactly you came across Jorge Luis Borges in your time in Scotland? Well, I was um, studying with a Scottish poet called Alastair Reid. He was my main mentor when I was in Scotland for seven years. And his um, interest was partly in um, translating Latin American authors. He translated Pablo Neruda and Jorge Luis Borges. These were the two greatest Latin American authors of the day, possibly of all time. And um, in fact, I met both of these authors through Alistair, uh, which was quite amazing to me. Uh, I had never heard of them at the time because I was you know, just starting off as a student. I didn't know much about anything. And uh, <clears throat> certainly had never heard of Jorge Luis Borges until Alistair told me he was coming to Scotland to do some work with him. And so um, that was my introduction. Borges arrived in St. Andrews. I never met him before. Met him through Alistair. And uh, Alistair asked me to be his uh, chauffeur while I was in Scotland. And so that's how that transpired. Wonderful. And you describe this novel as basically a novelistic memoir of stories that you've told for mm-hmm. years, and yeah. it skates the line between fiction and nonfiction. And you yourself go between many different genres, including poetry and biography. I guess, is there something that compels you towards certain forms at certain times? Well, I try to um, um, tailor uh, the genre to the material. Depends what's in front of me. Uh, in this case, I had a, a, vi- a vivid recollection, but it's from 50 years ago. So there's no way you can remember exactly what happened. So I had to really invent a lot of it. I mean, inventing all of the dialogue, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't carrying a tape recorder with me. I didn't have, I had a handful, a few notes in my note, in my journal, but just a few scratches. So I, I was really just basing this whole book on memories, which I'm reconstructing and And as I'm reconstructing, as you would naturally, you reinvent. And you mentioned that you made up all the dialogue based on your recollections. It seems that throughout the book, you've kind of developed this skill of describing the Scottish Highlands to this blind man. Was that, you think, a skill that you actually developed then? Or was that just as the dialogue was invented? Oh, I think it was invented, but... um... I do think there was something in describing the landscape, the Borges, that really did help me to refine my own technique for describing with particularity. I mean, the whole stress in the book that Borges makes to the young Jay is be very particular. Don't say flower, say daffodil. Don't say cloud, say cirrus cloud. Don't say bird, say um, gannet or rook. Be very specific in the when you describe things and um, always create images. So I, I worked to develop images in this book and make it a very visual, uh, concrete evocation of the nature nature of Scotland. 
when you talk about specificity in terms of writing, that's clearly a technique that you've developed over the years. When you're teaching both fiction and poetry, do you go about them in different ways? And this is this idea of creating images and specificity throughout your approach to writing and teaching all these oh, genres? I think, I think so. Um, I mean, two, I do two kinds of teaching. One is creative writing. And in the past, I've taught fiction, but I mostly teach poetry. And then I teach literature courses. But in the literature courses, you're essentially, you know, looking at the images that are created by the poets or even by the fiction writers. I mean, um, every every writer, even a prose writer, works in images and uh, and symbols. And so you're trying to learn how to read the images, imagery and the symbolism of great writers. And, um, you know, nowadays I mostly teach poetry. So I'm looking at poems and how poets ground their poems in specific concrete images and, and how the meaning uh, emerges from that imagery. In one of the literature classes, which I took with you, you discussed all these poets and writers that you got a chance to meet and interact with. Was this was there something specific about this Borges encounter, which seems to be much smaller in terms of time that you spent with him compared to others like James Merrill and Seamus Heaney? That, was there something about Borges that specifically made you feel like there was a novel in here? You know, he clearly, first of all, was an intriguing character. I mean, he's one of the great poets and, and, and story writers and, and literary imaginations of the 20th century. Um, I spent 50 years reading him, and his work has had a transformative effect on my own thinking about how, what is liter especially about what is literary creativity and originality. So um, these subjects were deeply important to me. And also, I wanted to write about that time in Scotland, and this was a good excuse to do it. Having a road trip to talk about is fun. So, um, you know, I had some very amusing anecdotes. And, you know, obviously, I knew Alistair Reed over, over 50 years as a friend, but Borges knew briefly. But he came into my life at a very important moment when I was in that transition from adolescence into young manhood. Wonderful. Yeah, I think there's a section at the end of Borges and Me that kind of sums up your experiences with him after vigorously drafting a poem in a church you write i felt close to billy who was your friend in vietnam maybe even to god or whatever i met when i was using that word the persistence of souls was an old platonic idea i could live with of course we all proceed as borges put it on insufficient knowledge and i was no different from anyone else in this my faith was probably no more than a gut level trust in the power of the universe to lift us when we needed lifting and this idea gave me a very interesting question about the presence of faith in your work, both in the novel and in your poetry. I realize, especially in your latest collection, West Mountain Epilogue, God is nonspecific, and the poems rather focus on the process of having faith. And mm -hmm. I read them as a Hindu, and I found them quite relatable. In your writing life, do you place an emphasis on the generic process of faith, or is it more specific Christian beliefs. Oh, no, very much. I mean, my, my faith and my interest in faith and writing about it is all about process. It's about how we access faith, what it means to have any kind of faith. I mean, I see God as a very nebulous concept in many ways, but, but a spirit that moves within us and we can attach certain names to it. You know, in Hindu religion, you can attach many gods, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can attach different names to God. But in, in, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we tend to have this one word for God. But in fact, if you actually, the more you know about it, the more complicated it gets. I mean, if you look at the Hebrew Bible, there's at least three or four names for God. And it's probably because there were different gods in the old days. Um, so, um, you know, El Elohim, Adonai, Yahweh, different names are used for God over and over again. And I think these are all aspects of God. And in the Christian tradition, we have the three gods. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And I see these as being the Spirit within us, being the Holy Ghost, Spirit above us, being God, Spirit beside us, being like a friend, being Jesus. So these, these are all just different names for, for aspects of, of the divine, which interests me. And I'm interested in all of this stuff. You mentioned you're interested in specifically from a writing standpoint you've written a novel about saint paul and of course faith is very important in your poetry what do you think the place of faith is to first of all yourself as a poet and for any poet in general well you know i can only speak for myself as far as faith and poetry 
uh, for me to have some faith is seems central to my to my work. Uh, I don't know where I how I would operate without it. So, um, but what does faith mean? It's a essentially it's essentially a trust uh, in in the, in the nature of in the nature of the universe. Verse I think of that word in the Bible, a logos, and in the beginning of the Gospel of Saint John, we read, "In the beginning was the Word," and that Greek word in that Gospel is logos. And that essentially means the shaping intelligence of the universe. So let's just translate that properly. In the beginning was a kind of shaping intelligence. And this is what we call God, or we can call it many different things. You know, and, and I think this, that this shaping intelligence is inside of us, and we find God within ourselves. And I think that the creative process mimics the creative activity of, of the spirit. I mean, in the sense that they say, God say, created the universe. Well, we create the universe as we write. We're always um, finding, Shakespeare put it well when he said that the purpose of, of writing is to find a local habitation in the name for the broad spirit that's out there. So it's all a process of finding the concrete images, the local place, the habitation, how to ground faith, ideas. Uh, spiritual wanderings in specific language. And I think those sentiments that you express are almost identical to something you wrote in a CNN op-ed where you quoted what well, you quoted Frost saying poetry and religion, what they have in common is the attempt to say matter in terms of spirit or spirit exactly. in terms of matter. Exactly. I always love that quote from Frost. Spirit in terms of matter, matter in terms of spirit. That's essentially what you're doing as a poet. On these same lines of faith, I read this article in The New Yorker by Cornel West where he described a spiritual decay in the culture. And I mm -hmm. remember you mentioning something very similar in class as well about the consequences of the decline of religion in society. Can you say more about what you think that looks like and what these consequences are? Well, I think because of the decline of a religious sensibility um, and, and, and a, a shrinking from the spirit and the workings of the spirit, We've seen a flattening out of our culture, and people live on a very surface level, and and as a result, their imagery has no depth. Um, they they're reading only only the brittle surface of the world, and not and refusing to dig beneath it. I mean, I really believe that nature is a kind of paradigm, and that we dig into nat natural images, and we get into the spirit world very quickly once we once we um see beyond the tree and the rock and the lake. I mean, they're representative of, of a larger spiritual world. I mean, I'm very Emersonian in my thinking. This is all goes back to Emerson and transcendentalism. And I'd say I would locate my own writing and thinking and living very much in that transcendental fat mode or tradition. And just kind of to clarify on those lines, can you say more about how specifically about transcendentalism and how that affects your thinking? Well, Emerson was the founding father of the transcendental movement, which was, you know, in the middle years of the 19th century. So these are writers who really did find God in nature and God in other people as well. Uh, transcend means to lift above, transcendari, to move beyond something. And so we're moving beyond the literal surface into the deeper uh, world of faith and, and spirit. In his wonderful book, Nature, uh, published in 1836, Emerson talks about um, spirit and nature and language and how language operates to try and uh, help us gain access to a, a fuller spiritual life. And uh, Emerson was, I think, the great teacher of anybody who wants to live in a spiritual way. You know, and he was direct getting his ideas from Emanuel Swedenborg, the great 17th century Swedish mystic, and, and he was getting his ideas from Plato. I mean, we're, we're reaching back here, obviously, in transcendentalism to Platonism and, and certain Greek thinkers, such as uh, of the Platonists called Plotinus. These are, these are all very mystical, spiritual writers. You started reaching back to all these philosophers. I guess in today's polarized society, we can debate about how much technology has had an effect on that. What do you think a resurgence of spirituality and faith would look like? Well, I think it would be amazing if people started taking it seriously. Because I do think that one of the main ideas of most religions is that we find spirit in community and, and, and we, we treat other people like we wish to be treated ourselves it would be an extraordinary shift in this society if everybody thought 
I'm really going to treat other people the way I want to be treated myself and look at everybody as holy and everything as holy. And, uh, and we would get beyond the kind of rancorous divisiveness. I mean, we live in such a, and especially even the problem is even you look at the evangelicals in this country, they've, they, it's, re, it's a reductive form of spirituality that really does, um, you know, a real a disservice to anybody who's seeking a spiritual life. I mean, it's so nasty and, um, and, and I'm aggressively terrified of other cultures, misogynistic, uh, and uh, all kinds of terrible things. So I think that the evangelicals in this country have actually done a great harm to the religious um, evolution of the society. Now, my apologies in advance. I think the questions might dive in a little bit into these terrible, rancorous society that you just Please mentioned. Please do. I don't care. Um, um, in two of your poems, specifically, Ars Poetica and Towards the Poetics of the Next Generation, you reflect on the place of the poet and poetry in the future. In Ars mm -hmm. Poetica, you write that poets must sweep the world, and it's heavy work, but someone has to do it. Somebody must rumble and contend. And then right. in, towards the poetics, you place the art of poetry in the context of social, environmental, and political issues. In today's society, Nabokov says writers only have words to play with. What does a writer and a poet do? What can they do? Well, I do think that you can do a lot. Um, Auden in September 1st, 1939 says, all I have is a voice to undo the folded lie, the lie in the street. Well, that's a hell of a deal if you can undo the folded lie. And so I think writers have an, uh, not only an opportunity, but an obligation to try and undo lies and to try and you know, bring people to their senses wherever they can. Um, you know, I don't always write with a political edge, but I do sometimes. I mean, I've, I've been very much anti-war. I've been very much trying to promote uh, the res publica, which means the public thing. I think Republicans often forget that the, the root uh, word Republican is res publica, the public thing, right? Res is thing, publica, public. And I think, you know, to get back to a sense of the, our civic duty and to give poets some sense of duty and responsibility to the society is, is terribly important. And, you know, the great poets have always been aware of their social world, aware of their community, and have, and have uh, you know, spoken with a voice to a particular, you know, point of view. In that sense, do you think all poetry, whether or not it's explicitly political or addressing current situations, is all poetry indirectly addressing political situations? Well, in, indirectly. I mean, you can write love poems that don't have much to do with the social a network or with with people's with the community or nature poems but i think you know nature poems inevitably these days have an elegiac aspect because we're looking at a declining world where nature is under threat i mean we're under such a global threat uh, as far as the environment goes so i think it's partly the duty of a poet to keep drawing attention to, uh, at least as an elegist you know saying i'm so sorry that it's falling apart i do that in a lot of my poems you know um, poem about, there's a poem about the trees in Scranton, Pennsylvania being cut down. I mean, I, don't, I write about these things over and over again. I think your latest collection, West Mountain Epilogue, seems to focus a lot on your time in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in coal mining yeah. country. Sure. And you mentioned your anti-war sentiments, and I want to dive into that at the end. In the literature class, you raved about Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, all these great World War I anti-war poets. And an important through line in Borges and Me is indeed these strong anti-war sentiments as you're avoiding your draft letters that they keep sending you. Even some of your poetry is filled with fear and anger about the war and the loss of soldiers. Right now, there's this terrible war going on in Ukraine, and technology, for better or worse, enables us to get this constant flow of footage and content about the atrocities happening and opinion about the atrocities happening. How much weight does art and poetry have in the midst of this? And does it stand a chance against this constant flow of content? Well, I think you can live in, in a parallel world where it's, it's it adding their, the comments. You know, obviously the audience for poetry is small, but I think, you know, if, if smart poets are able to articulate feelings about the war, as with the Vietnam War, I mean, poetry doesn't change things in the sense of stop wars from happening. But I do think that poetry can you know, in certain people help to change the consciousness in a society. And even people when they don't aren't, aren't aware of it sometimes can find themselves 
uh, thinking in fresh ways. I mean, the Vietnam War was a great example of that. It was a small group of people at first who thought the Vietnam War was a tragic mistake. And writing about it um, gradually, I mean, some of the great poets of the day, Adrian Rich wrote a wonderful book of poems about the war. And I think that the the uh, the ultimate effect was that, I don't want to call it the intelligentsia, but the people who can who shape ideas, educated people, um, people at the higher end of the of this of the uh, media food chain, um, when they start having a change of opinion and articulating things in a very broad, clear way, it can have a big effect on uh, how people, how the the country feels. And and you know this is this is partially a democ. This isn't we we don't live in a pure democracy by any means, but yet nevertheless the country, the, at least the, the government, should be a, on some level ultimately responsible for the opinion of the people. And so there's, you know, different opinions now. I mean, I, I do think we've got, strangely, uh, a lot of unanimity about the invasion of Ukraine. Really, Republican, Democrat, there's hardly a person in this country that doesn't think it was a horrible thing for Russia to have done to invade Ukraine. In these ideas, you mentioned the intellectuals who are shaping public opinion. In my opinion, those are the same people that would be reading poetry and consuming art and culture. This is very far-fetched, but do you have a way to, I guess, in your mind, to spread art that could eventually create this resurgence of a public space that you talked about? Well, it's an interesting idea. I mean, I would love to see poetry gaining a, a broader footing and, and affecting people. I mean, I think it can. There's certainly always interest. I was just noticing there's a new movie out right now in all the theaters about the poet Siegfried Sassoon and his own life in World War I. So there is, you know, there is interest in this stuff. And I think a poet, poets like Mary Oliver and Adrian Rich and even Seamus Heaney had a pretty big effect on a lot of people. Wonderful. A final question. You've mentioned lots of poets today. In the spirit of Ezra Clyde, what have you been reading, listening to, and or watching lately that you've been excited about? Well, you know, I, I'm, I, the book I've just read is a book about um, the critical revolutionaries in the beginning of the, in the middle years of the 20th century. Uh, important writers who really did change how people view literature. Uh, Terry Eagleton is a wonderful literary critic, and he's written this book called Critical Revolutionaries. And it's kind of exciting. And I just uh, finished reading that with great excitement. I read Philip Levine, Louise Glick, Mary Oliver, uh, you know, all the time. I go back to Hopkins. I go back to Frost endlessly. I go back to, I love, I've been reading again, W.H. Auden. His two volumes of collected poems have just come out, and I'm very eagerly uh, getting ready to, to dive into those and look at them in a broader way, a more detailed way than I ever have. As you mentioned that, I was thinking when we talked about spreading poetry to the masses and kind of using it to create some level of unanimity, I feel like music is also not necessarily taken the place of poetry, but definitely assumed some of the cultural content that poetry used to take over do you oh, sure have, do you think it's as effective well I, I think you know you can hardly even begin to calculate the effect of bob dylan over 60 years and um you know poems like w with god on our side is one of the great anti-war poems and um so dylan has had a profound influence i think over the decades and i think there are the many many writers of music have just been spectacularly effective and, you know, Neil Young and uh, Jackson Brown and so many, James Taylor, I mean, like all that stuff. You know, I think there's a lot of possibility there, a lot of possibility. And that's our show. Special thanks to Jay Perini for joining me on this episode. To learn more about his work and see a list of the recommendations from the episode, visit the show notes in the description. Thank you very much for listening to our first episode. Cultural Mixtapes is written and produced by me, Tejas Srinivasan. The music you heard on today's episode was Beethoven's Sonata No. 26 and Chopin's Sonata No. 2, recorded by me. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, review, and share on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Thank you very much for listening.